membranes of the human body. A membrane is a covering usually that reduces friction and also provides a little bit of protection. And very often in the body, you'll find that the membranes are um, serving also the functions of helping either with absorption or secretion of important substances. So I'm going to go ahead and list the four kinds, and then we'll talk a little more about each one. Okay, number one is the cutaneous membrane. That is your skin or your integument. And we've talked about that a bit already on a different page of your notes, but just for review, I want to remind you that the skin has a lot of keratin in it, and that allows it to be waterproof. And keratin is just a, a waterproof protein that uh, it actually has wa some wax, it's waxy, so it has fat in it, that allows the waterproofing to be successful. And uh, the top layer of your skin, the epidermis, is mostly dead cells. And then the dermis uh, contains accessory organs and um, such as sweat glands, oil glands, and um, also erector pili muscles, along with hair follicles. And this should be filled with normal flora. We're going to make a point of contrasting. Some membranes have a lot of bacteria and others don't. I think I read a study once where there's something like 20 different species of bacteria just in a square inch in your inner elbow, just to give you an idea of how, how much you're covered with normal flora. When I say flora, I mean mostly bacteria, but also a variety of um, funguses and yeast, things like that. Okay, now membrane number two, serous membranes. Serous membranes make a slippery fluid called serous fluid. You can remember that, right? S for slippery. Slippery serous fluid. The other thing you can remember about the letter S in serous membranes is that these should be sterile. You have three serous membranes in your body, and if any of them get infected, that is life-threatening. Those three are the pleura, using blue, and if someone has inflammation of that, it sometimes is called pleuritis, mostly I hear it called pleurisy. And the serous fluid helps actually with the in inflation of the lungs as well. And then, uh, look, this, this is a human from the side. And so you're seeing from the side some cut coils. The mid-sagittal section. And the peritoneum. surrounds each coil of intestine. So you see the word peri means around and oneum means intestine. And maybe you've heard of peritonitis. If any kind of fecal matter in the colon perforates the colon, in the, for example, in appendicitis, if the appendix bursts, then fecal matter can get into the abdominal cavity and the peritoneum can become infected and we call that peritonitis. And then, last but not least, the pericardium 
is a membrane that surrounds the heart. And if that becomes inflamed, we call that pericarditis. So we'll come back a little bit more to the structure of the serous membranes, but for now you can know that these are all um, serous membranes. There are three of them, and they all start with a P. Pleura starts with a P, peritoneum starts with a P, and pericardium starts with a P. Okay, then over probably to my favorite kinds of membranes in the body, the mucous membranes. Let me just tell you something. If you want to keep from having diarrhea, if you want to keep from having respiratory infections and sinus infections and vaginal infections or urinary tract infections, then the best thing I can tell you to do is have your body covered in normal flora. That means play in the dirt and eat a lot of yogurt. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of simplification there. But the idea is, is that normal flora abound in the mucous membranes and the best way to keep out the ones that are going to make you sick the salmonellas and the e coli in the urinary tract or the candida in the vaginal tract the best way to keep those out is to have the good guys there and acting as bouncers essentially we'll learn more about that in microbiology okay so one mucous membrane is the GI tract. Just like it sounds, it's going to be making uh, mucus, and that mucus re reduces friction as foodstuffs move through the GI tract. And that word tract uh, should point out to you that this kind of, it's like a tube through your body. It's a tube open at both ends. Uh, like a water slide. This tube is open at the mouth and this end of the tube is open at the anus. So that's why we call it a tract because it goes all the way through. It's open to the outside. Okay, then let's look at the respiratory tract which is also open to the outside but only up at the mouth, right? It's not open down in the bronchial tree. So I guess, I'm not sure what I just said there, but a tract is open to the outside but not open at both ends. And this is the respiratory tract. And everybody knows you get lots of mucus if you have a respiratory infection. And then the urinary tract. So this represents the ureters coming from the kidneys and then the bladder and then the urethra. The urinary tract. In females, the urethra is quite a bit sh shorter than in males, and that's one of a couple of reasons why women are more likely to get urinary tract infections. And then um, in males, the um, reproductive tract, since the semen and the urine come out the same opening, they're combined. But in females, they have an, a separate opening for their reproductive tract, the vagina, and that goes up into the uh, well, so here's the vagina up to the uterus and then the fallopian tubes. Maybe you've heard of pelvic, pelvic inflammatory disease. Unfortunately, what can happen with that sometimes is let's say that a young girl is sexually active and not telling her parents or anyone about it, and she gets uh, what originally starts as, you know, a reproductive infection um, that, but then it spreads, and it spreads up into the uterus and then potentially even into the abdominal cavity, and it can cause so much scarring in the fallopian tubes that it can cause sterility. So it's really important for teenagers, if they're sexually active, uh, to make sure that, um, that they're willing to talk to somebody about it, even if they're embarrassed. And then there's one other mucus membrane and that is in the eye 
where it covers the both the, um, it covers the cornea and actually the underside of the eyelid, and we call that the conjunctiva. And if that um, gets an infection, then that's uh, what we call pink eye or conjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis indicates there's inflammation there. That could just be maybe from a really windy day. Pink eye is more specifically a bacterial infection in the eye. Okay, and then a fourth kind of membrane, synovial membranes. And these are only found oops, in joints, and specifically in movable joints. And they reduce friction, they cushion the joint, in this picture if you imagine this is your femur and this is your tibia, you'll have a synovial membrane between the two and then synovial fluid inside of that that helps cushion the joint. So this would be the membrane. And then the fluid. There's an autoimmune disease called rheumatoid arthritis. And that is when the person's own white blood cells attack their own synovial membranes. So any autoimmune disease is a case of the body, the body's immune system attacking itself. It's sort of like friendly fire, where in a battle that you should be taking out the enemy, the pathogens, instead the white blood cells are hurting their own um, parts. Of course, this can be painful. There's um, swelling, and eventually the bones deform too. Defor deformation of the joints can um, occur after many years of the disease. Uh, while we're here, I'll mention there's a strong link with gluten sensitivity. So if you or someone you know has rheumatoid arthritis, it might be worth a try to go gluten-free for three to six months and see if the symptoms improve. Okay, I'm running out of time on this video, but I will. I was going to talk a little bit more about the different kinds of serous membranes. I'm just going to do this pretty quickly. Every serous membrane has an outer part. Like imagine if this is the, the heart and this is the intestine. That outer part is called the parietal layer. So this would be the parietal pericardium. This would be the parietal peritoneum. And then there's always an inner layer to these membranes. That's right upon the organ. And we call those the visceral layer of the serous membrane. So the visceral peritoneum here. and then this would be the visceral pericardium. And it should be sterile, and then the serous fluid would be in this space here. Between the layers.